Hello and welcome to The Hearing, I'm John. And from Chicago's North Side, I'm Scotto. And before we get to this week's album, we've got some, once again, some listeners submitted on The Hearing. This is from John Phillips on Facebook, uh, f- in reference to uh, the mo- album we did a, a couple weeks ago, um, or a few couple episodes ago, I should say, um, Blacklight Syndrome by um, Bozio Levin's- Levin Stevens. Uh, he said, in regards to the minor Pink Floyd talk, it was most likely Gilmore who played bass on Hey You. Tony was the first post Waters. I was on the first post Waters release. Um, not momentary lapse. Was it momentary lapse? Yes. Yeah, a momentary lapse of reason. That's what I figured. Um, I saw. I mean, there's him... only two post Waters albums. I mean, oh, you're not going to count the Endless River. Fuck yeah. that. That, that was just momentary the lapse odds and division and bell, right? Yeah, it was momentary lapse and division bell. Yeah, and John Fellows finishes up with saying, "I saw him play with Gabriel. Something to say." Um, well, Gabriel Live, of course, is something to say, but also oh, Tony, yeah. Tony Levin is, and I say this as a bassist, the man is just amazing. I mean, and not just as this, you know, incredible bass player, the the drumsticks were, yeah. was fucking inspired. The man has <laughs> little drumsticks that he puts on his fingertips. I think it's big time that he uses them for. He, he uses them on a lot. I swear, when I saw them live, he used to, I'm just like, I, I mean... It's in an arena, but you can see uh-huh. them yeah. from across it. You're just like, wait, what the fuck is he doing? He's got these things on his fingers? He's got little tips, from, uh, fingertips that he has small drumsticks attached to that he plays bass, bass with. That kind of thumping, slapping sound that he gets on big time. He's not slapping. He's using finger he, these these fingertip drumsticks. <laughs> it's, it's Yeah, just a genius. He's a genius. Uh, yeah, um... Side note, because I, I, something I wanted to mention um, when I when we talked about that album about Levin, I read in an interview years ago when he does a session in the UK versus America. It's very different experiences. Over in the UK, they ask him to they always ask him to do something different, you know, do something interesting. In America, it's always just to stick to the groove. <laughs> I just found that as an an interesting dichotomy. Now, something I forgot to mention last week, um, in, in my um, fusion binging to prepare for that review, I found out that the title Sapphire Bullets of Pure Love was used well before They Might Be Giants. Oh. It was a Mahavishnu Orgish song from their 73 album uh, Birds of Fire, and the track is just 24 seconds, really 20 seconds, it, it goes silent at 20 seconds of the band just making noise <laughs> there's a lot of that from the early 70s and it, it, it cuts like four seconds before the end of the track i i didn't check the next track it's kind of like probably just like a prelude to the next track kind of like the beginning of this week's artist um shoot high aim low where it's almost like there's orchestral tuning up sounds yeah kind of probably oh, okay. something kind of like that um not like seven, you know, creatures and a, you know, furry creatures. I can never get the title of that oh, yeah. song right. <laughs> but, you know, it, I was just, when I saw that Sapphire Bolts of Your Love, I was just shocked that, you know, they did this in 73 and then somewhere in the 90s, I don't remember the year offhand, TMVG just York, you know, yanks the title for one of their tracks and writes lyrics around it. T- TMG, uh, you know, they, they, that's just the type of thing they would do. They yeah, are very, yeah. they, that's the thing that they would go for. Right, right. Also, of course, because it's that time of year, early December, Spotify did their wrapped, you know, year end thing. I completely forgot about it until you, I thought it was going to be a little later. I was expecting December, it a couple for- later too, but then a couple weeks, in, in a couple weeks, I was hoping it would be done. I figured it would be done before we finished wrapped for the year because last year we finished up in on like December 12th and we talked about it. So I knew it was going to be early December, but then I saw a bunch I, of people posting it on Twitter. I forgot. I think they, they only go to the end of November yeah, and then yeah. they count at that. Yeah. I, I know it cuts off in November sometime because there was somebody I was binging at the end of last year who wasn't on mine. Um, oh. but this year, um, bandmade was not my artist of the year. Um, because they released their last album at the end of last year. And I guess there was a lot that I had listened to since then. Artist Artist of the Year was um, Breeze Pop, of course. I've been binging them since late September when the new album came out. Um, 
and it's odd because I think I've you know I'll see your your uh, playing, mm-hmm. and I, I think I've only seen them recently uh, on your play, like not like. Well, it's I haven't been, seen them frequently for I see. Well, it's been since I kind of got back into them uh, vamping here because I'm bringing Facebook up again because I don't have my full list. Um, but I, I got back into them in I got the my um, Kickstarter copy of Fantasizer in like late September, very early November yeah. or October rather. And ever it's since back when we reviewed them, yeah. Um, well, no, a few weeks before we reviewed, I because of the Kickstarter, yeah. I was able to get it. Um, so. I started binging them then, not just the new album. Actually, those for those few weeks, I wasn't listening to it on Spotify because it didn't hit Spotify for like a month or two after we reviewed it, or a month or so. Um, but I was listening to a lot of their older stuff, particularly a lot of stuff from uh, their previous album, Imaginary Friends, and I've been kind of obsessive about them. Um, just, again, bringing up my um, full list. Let's see. Um, oh, of course, if you click the link, it goes... Sh- straight to okay slight complaint tangent i had to do this on my phone this year yeah in previous years you could do it in a browser i'm old and have bad eyes i don't like doing (laughs) things on my phone that i don't have to do on my phone i accept it with instagram because they've always been that way but spotify really irritated me and some of that went by so fast you couldn't even read it because they were just putting up all of this data on you Mm -hmm. and you're just like wait what (laughs) i was surprised that fake names didn't factor in more so because i played the shit out of that album when it came out much like fantasizer um they were played during that whole montage didn't end up on any of my lists though um my top artists i'll go in uh, ascending order five robert plant five robert plant four saint vincent Three Punch Brothers, two Jellyfish, one Freeze Pop. No surprises, except I was I would have expected fake names up there. Um, my genre was rock. Interesting thing here is, Plant is the only rock artist there, or, you know, <laughs> and it's mo- mostly um, the al- principles of moments, the one we reviewed, which is really more new wave yeah. than rock. You know, Saint Vincent, I would consider pop. Jellyfish, definitely pop. Uh, Punch Brothers, progressive bluegrass, freeze pop, synth pop. Um, here we get into the interesting part. Um, my top songs goes to number one at number five, more jellyfish, Fadoodle by Licorice Quartet. Licorice Quartet, for those who don't know, is the, is three quarters of the last touring version of Jellyfish. Everybody but Andy Sturmer, the drummer and vocalist, who they all hated. Okay. They all got back together. Same kind of music. Um, a couple of St. Vincent songs next, Marrow and, um, Digital Witness, the two that I listened to obsessively. Um, kind of surprised Hang On Me I, it wasn't in there I listened to that one a lot too and uh, Rattlesnake um, I'm kind of you know like every St. Vincent fan kind of hooked on uh, self-titled hmm. and number one uh, number one this is the interesting thing um, this is the discussion <laughs> Snakes on a Plane Bring It by Cobra Starship <laughs> and I've never seen that on your status no no ever. because it's a guilty pleasure, and I always make sure it's not the last song I listen to. <laughs> I, uh, I, I've never thought of that, like, with the last thing I listened to. Because I think it's even stopped putting, like, the if you're in the middle of a song, it doesn't mm-hmm. put it on there. Okay. I don't know how it, exactly how that works, but I know the last thing I listen to, other people will see. So if it's something that is a bit of a guilty pleasure, I make sure it's not the last thing I listen to. <laughs> it's just, I mean, the lyrics are cheesy as fuck, but it's just got a great groove. I enjoy it. I've always, I've liked it ever since I saw the movie, saw heard it in the closing credits. I, yeah. I, I think I pirated the MP3. I'd forgotten about it until earlier this year, until... Um, Spotify put it on one of my lists. I'm like, oh shit, I used to love that song. So yeah, I listened I to it quite a bit. I saw the video or heard the song before I even saw the movie. Oh wow. Because I re- re- well, remember Snakes on a Plane, there was a lot of hype mm-hmm. yeah. building up to that movie. And yeah, that was one of the things, kind of like Cobra Starship, huh? <laughs> I've heard, I've checked out a couple other other songs. They're horrible. Just It's just that one that I, it's just the groove I like. Anyway. You have your lists? 
Uh, I could pretty much. <laughs> I can't really go by songs because it's just songs hmm. from a Jai Sarah Getty's a Jai. Oh, okay. But um, uh, and, and they kind of messed up because uh, Kenny Segal is probably just another name Serengeti's using. Oh, okay. <laughs> but it's it's who he did uh, a Jai with. So they have Kenny Segal as like the second you know most listened to artist. Um, so yours is basically just Chesky and, and the Serengeti. Serengeti was my was my number one. Mm -hmm. In fact, I am, you know, because it gives you that like you're yeah. in like his two per, yeah, percentage two percent, of listeners. Yeah. What, what was yours for? Do you for know free spot, I think for... it was two percent. I am <laughs> in the top point oh one percent. Oh well. Well, that's actually, I think it's, you're responsible for this percent of their plays. So it's a much smaller percentage for you. I'm responsible for 2% of the plays that Freeze Pop gets on all of Spotify. Um, I'm I glad I bought the was, album. I thought that was percentage of, it, as his fans, I thought. No, no, no. It, I, I, as I recall, it's, 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 it's you account for X percent of their plays. <laughs> Now I need to bring this up now because I really thought I think that's what it was. was. That's what I recall. I cause, no, the way they had it worded was you are in this percentage of his fan base. Okay, maybe I'm maybe it's the other way around. Um, was so, bigger. Yeah. Okay. Well, considering uh, considering Serengeti accounts for most of your top artists, uh, that makes sense. <laughs> the um, right, and so. It was uh now I'm drawing a blank on the other the names. Yeah, Chesky was mm -hmm. number I three. I recognize Chesky. There was only two names I knew. And uh, honestly, on Margaret's, he's number one because of me. <laughs> on Mrs. Scottos. <laughs> She's like, damn it, you ruined my list, my rap list. <laughs> I told her how to take her. things out. And then I think Serengeti was like number five on hers too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so she was listening to it all. I mean, I, I, I messaged her and told her how to remove things from her history, so hopefully she's done that. All right, so uh, fourth on my list was uh, Pearl Jam, and then uh, fifth was LP, the other half of Run the Jewels. Okay. I, I was into his solo album for a while. I think really fifth, if we're counting Serengeti and, and Kenny Seagal mm -hmm. uh, in one, it would be um, actually Lennon Claypool Delirium. Okay, okay. Because um, I listened to them quite a bit early in the year. I was wondering about LP because it's E L dash P. Yes. And I was confused. Is this some variation of Emerson Lake and Palmer? <laughs> it was funny because, you know, I'm looking for Emerson Lake and Palmer records, you know, back mm. in the day. And, you know, then it's like, hey, who's this guy? And I had no idea until uh, Run the Jewels. And, uh, yeah, let's see. It, 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 the songs are just absolute nonsense. It has intermission as the most listened to song. And I think it took me a while to figure out why the Ajay album is two halves. Mm -hmm. There's the Ajay story. And then there's the Kenny Dennis story. And uh, the intermission of course is, you know, the middle of it. So I think there were times where I was just listening to one or the other and it would somehow just be in there. You know, I'd probably start with the intermission to listen to the Kenny Dennis side or listen to it all the way through to the intermission if i was just listening to the ajai side okay um yeah i in the cases where you know uh, things like that happen weird songs can end up as your um you know recommendations i know that happens to me a lot you know invariably the the albums i listen to once for this show end up part of my recommendations yeah i mean two songs that are off that that are like fourth and fifth mm -hmm. you know don't wear that suit a, a jai is like you know kind of the single-ish version of the you know song from the album uh -huh. but i always like the summary that has like this weird like spaghetti western kind of sound to it <laughs> <laughs> but uh -huh. he's just rapping quickly over it's pretty it's pretty interesting uh -huh. and it, of course it's a really interesting st funny story <laughs> i did it yeah, it says, um, let's see, my top genre was rock as well, despite... Yeah, again, um, a weird, especially weird choice for you. 
despite Pearl Jam being the only rock person yeah. in my top five. I mean, outside but then of... letting Claypool Delirium, I guess, can yeah, qualify they can. that. And then they, yeah, aside from you know what was on most of my list, I do listen to a lot of rock on there, and some of that, like Jellyfish, you could call rock. Cobra, that one Cobra Starship song you could call rock, I guess. But you, it's it's all. I mean, outside of Pearl Jam, it is a lot of uh, hip hop. So, yeah, there's Run the Jewels, which I wasn't that thrilled with the latest album this mm-hmm. year. Um, I mean, there, there's some great parts of it. Of course, they got Zach De La Rocha back for one. Zach De La Rocha and um, oh Pharrell doing something together, which could have been better. But just to have the two of them together working mm-hmm. together was really kind of neat. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned Zach De La Rocha. There was something I sent you on Facebook a while ago. I need to do. We need to discuss. I need to remind you if you saw an involved rage against the machine. Oh, what? Well, we'll discuss later. It was a video from okay. a, around the time of. The, well, I'll just mention there was a video from around the time of the you know stop the count count the votes protests. Oh, it was the couple that was dancing you know. at, at a stop the count <laughs> protest to killing in the name of. Yeah, they. I don't think that that means what they think it means. Exactly, exactly. Because <laughs> they were also, it was like a Blue Lives Matter flag. Yeah, and it was kind right. of like, I think that's quite the opposite of what yeah. they were going for. At that. <laughs> exactly. Um, before, just, just a hunch. Before we get to this example, one last thing. Just a quick plug for Ben Maid's new single, Different. They dropped it yesterday on YouTube and Spotify. Great song. Um, probably the heaviest and one of the noisiest songs they've done so far. Um, and the last song on their previous label before they moved to their new one, new album's going to be out on January 20th. Um, so of course, you know, those of us who were a little gun shy since they did that song start over, which is a straight up 320 pop song. It was a deliberate attempt to do a 320 pop song. They succeeded rather well. A lot of us are very nervous that they're going to go in a pop direction with the new label. So we'll see. Anyway, finally, on to this week's album, which is from 1971, Fragile by Yes. A little change in plans. We were going to do the Yes album, but then we got to talking about it after last week and couldn't decide between Fragile or the Yes album. I leaned toward the Fragile because there there were more songs on it that I hadn't heard before. And because it was easiest to easier to to photoshop into the thumbnail and to be honest because my favorite yes song is on this album so my favorite was easy to pick um so there i'm i'm yeah. struggling i'm struggling between which one as to pick as my strongest honestly uh-huh. anyway yes are an english progressive rock band formed in london in 1968 throughout the band's history there have been 19 full-time members <laughs> That's funny. That is staggering. I knew a lot of people were in Yes, but that is staggering. I think, I don't think any of them have been there the entire time. Uh, except, uh... I think even Anderson has I mean, bowed out at times. Well, yes, definitely. Anderson, uh, yeah, I wasn't thinking of that, because I think they picked up it. I was thinking Squire would be the, the one until his no, passing. Oh, uh, no, I think Relayer, where they brought Trevor Horn in. I think Trevor Horn played bass on it. Really? I'm pretty sure he played bass too. As I well didn't as know that. We'll have to check. Huh. But, uh, maybe Squire has been there the whole time. I'm not sure. Anyway, the, of, among those 19 members are uh, such legendary musicians as Steve Howe, uh, guitarist Steve Howe, and keyboardist Rick Wakeman, both of whom played on Fragile, which is the band's fourth studio album. It was released on November 26th, 1971. On Atlantic Records, produced by Yes and Eddie Offord, and features John Anderson on lead vocals and backing vocals, Steve Howe on electric and acoustic guitars and backing vocals, Chris Squire on bass guitars, backing vocals, and electric guitar. Take deep, deep breath for this one. Rick Wakeman <laughs> on Hammond Organ Grand Piano, RMI 368 Electra Piano and Harpsichord, Mellotron and Mini Moog Synthesizer. I love how keyboard players back in the 70s and 80s would list everything they played. If you were right. a burgeoning keyboard player, probably was very cool because you got to see all the got to find out all the gear they used. And now, Bill Bruford on drums and percussion. I'm looking at because of course Wikipedia does the crazy, you know, timeline of the band. Mm-hmm. And Squire, I, like, there's like a brief like 1981 where there's nothing uh-huh. for some reason. 
uh squire is there the entire time oh and there's also nothing between like 2005 and 2009 okay i guess he did play bass on relay i thought trevor horn did because trevor horn is a bassist played in the bogles so i thought he came in on bogles and bass but squire was still there so squire is the continual member even through abwh anderson bruford wakeman and how which didn't have (laughs) which was this lineup without john anderson anyway Reminder, I don't edit any songs into our reviews for copyright reasons, but down in the description, if you're listening to this on YouTube or on our blog at johnscotto.com, you'll find links to find Fragile on Spotify and YouTube, so you can follow along if you'd like. On to track one. There's like four absolute fucking classics on this album, starting yeah. with track one, Roundabout. Lo- probably their most favorite song, most famous song, I should say. Um, yeah, love the way the opening fades in. I think it's backwards guitar, uh, and just that whole acoustic guitar in the opening. Love, absolutely classic. Also, absolutely classic is the bass line. It's it's kind of almost like the the stairway of bass. <laughs> the the intro. I was kind of wondering. Is, does it really fit the rest of the song? <laughs> you know that that, cla- no. that classical guitar that he's doing at the beginning that fades in. It doesn't fit the song, but it is just so memorable and so brilliant. And it's really a fake out, though, isn't it? Oh, it's yeah. just like uh, you know, a lot of bands I think were doing that at this time, where they're they're building your expectation of this twee kind of you know mm-hmm. classical band and and. They're ready, to, of course, to give you like a left hook that yeah. you're just not expecting. And I love how that heavy bass and that riff is all bass, that not guitar. And it I, is. I love how that just hits you out of nowhere. And the guitar in that point, it's still acoustic for that first verse. He's just playing harmonics. Mm-hmm. That's the weirdest thing that, you know, I don't think I ever really noticed that. I mean, I always knew that that was the bass, you know, going because it's just yeah. so goddamn funky, especially for a prog band. But it, in the back, how is still playing this acoustic guitar yeah, to go along with playing this? Playing from like, harmonics oh, on this acoustic. You don't get an electric guitar until the chorus. Right. Well, speaking of the chorus, love the fast keyboard part and, and the vocal harmonies. The vocal I mean that's one thing yes you, you have to love about yes is the harmonies. Like yeah. they all sang and all sang brilliantly. Um and, and probably even Bruford. Um and and think about it, this is about five years before Boston yeah. and did a long time and they completely ripped this whole thing off. Oh yeah, yeah. Um like the song it. Long Time. Mm-hmm. That's the keys that that I mean directly here verbatim. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um love how the groove stutters in the chorus. And then we get this minor key bass riff for the bridge that I think might even be <laughs> better than the verse. That bridge are you talking about that? at 320 yeah where it just goes into this like kind of almost merengue kind of yeah yeah exactly (laughs) you're just like wait what (laughs) Uh, yeah like it's kind of like you you remember when you first listened to this song you're like wow i did not see this coming (laughs) (laughs) and then they go back to the chorus but it's acoustic and really soft after this thunderous minor key bridge and then they just get loud again totally ripped off on the lamb but i think <laughs> it was almost like a nod like the part yeah. that he just played briefly in like hairless heart right um then it just gets explosive again i love how insistent bruford gets during the instrumental break and then we get steve <laughs> howe and rick wakeman trading solos right you kind of get this you kind of get the classical prog sound almost six minutes in yeah and yeah that whole duetting bass and guitar thing it's just such a joy to listen to. Mm-hmm. And it's just, they get so loud on this one, it's, which is not an adjective you would typically associate with Yes, even though this is probably their best known song. Outside of a like the 90125 stuff. A lot of this album is balancing the really quiet yeah. and the really heavy. <laughs> but yeah, they, they do this duet with the bass and the lead guitar, and then they split so briefly and this start doing this like kind of separate showboating at the same time yeah, yeah and we were talking about this last time wakeman was only in the band for like two albums but yeah he's so iconic that 
you know, he's the only one you really remember. I know Tony K because of 90125 and I that's when we all rediscovered them. But, you know, Wakeman is is so closely associated even with the band even though he was only in there very briefly. They bring him back though, I think, according to this timeline in like the early or like in the late 70s. Oh, okay. Which which I think I cuz one of my favorite albums for them and I wasn't really expecting this is like in the late seventies, called uh, "Going for the One." Okay, I know the title. So I'm not familiar with the album. Though. Yeah, it's it's just it's almost like a a normal album. Whereas this is kind of like their last normal album until that. When I say normal, mm-hmm. you know, like eight to twelve songs. Classic, yes. <laughs> you know, going going into one record because after this, you know, it's like three songs oh. is the album kind of thing oh. uh, before they get proper prog. And then, yeah, then you, get, you know, the highlight is Tales for uh, the Tales Summit of, is uh, Tales for from Topographical Oceans, right. where it's just it was too ridiculous even for Wakeman's standards. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned the balance, and we talked about this briefly last week. I think it was on air. Yes, was kind of like it seems from the outside. I've never read anything about this, but it was. It seems like there were two camps, or, or three camps. You have the hippies, Anderson and Howe. Yeah. And you can tell from the instrumental, guitar instrumental later in the album, Howe was a hippie. Actually, I distinctly remember when GTR ended, um, someone asked um, Hackett what it was like to work with um, Howe. And his his exact quote was, one word, vegetarian. (laughs) It's kind of strange because I think Hackett had another album planned mm. with them well i think they did two through. albums but um no i think they only did the one okay i thought I remember and hackett, the... hackett had material written for a second uh-huh. and then it never and never went through and he wound up releasing it like way later like in uh-huh. the night late 90s almost well, because they're polar opposites you know as i've mentioned before hackett is renowned for his e- his he's as renowned for his ego as he's renowned for his guitar playing I don't and, know if I've heard. I've heard. I remember you saying that once. I don't re- really recall people. I mean, he's an odd duck, obviously. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he strikes me as very egotistical and arrogant, and but, and just that kind of very, um, very masculine, very tr- you know, but, traditionally masculine. And Hackett is such a fucking hippie. You mean how? How rather is such a fucking hippie. But I've but, never really thought of Hackett as like the. Okay, that seems to be what uh, I've gotten, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, I mean, he's always like the problem with Genesis was he was too soft spoken. Oh, you know, okay. to really. That's surprising. Do, you know, but maybe I'm wrong. Advocate um, for his stuff, because, but it also could be his stuff wasn't as strong yeah, as the others perhaps. either. <laughs> um, couple, two ways of looking but at that. Getting back to yes, you have Anderson and Howe, the hippies, and then you know, even though they're two of the greatest musicians on the planet. Squire and Bruford were really like seemed like the rockers, the ones who just wanted to get loud. Yeah, and then Wakeman was just his own thing. I'd say Bruford was more of like a jazz guy, almost. He, you know, he, he was, but you know, you have that definite loud contingent in this band that that almost yeah. metal side, and that can't just be Chris Squire, right? I, I'm thinking Bruford's also part of that. So you get this weird mix on the album. And then move, moving on to track two, you get Rick Wakeman. Track two, Cans and Brahms. It's instrumental. It's an arrangement <laughs> of a Brahms piece arranged by Wakeman. It's just all synthesizers, multi-tracked with different sounds. This is my pick for Weakest. Yeah, um, th- this is pretty low. Uh, I mean, it's not as interesting as what ELP has do- had uh-huh. done this already a few times because they would do it as the whole band right. playing a classic. Exactly. Piece, they which... would arrange it for the whole band and it would work. And that's what I was hoping what this would be was when I saw what it, you know, it was a Brahms piece. But no, it's just multi track synthesizers. It feels like mall Christmas music. Like, have you heard the, the first ELP album where they begin with, like, The Barbarian, which yeah, I forget yeah. what classical piece it is. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's just, it's just nuts. Yeah. <laughs> like, Palmer, <laughs> his drums on this classical piece. 
Because they arranged it for the band and they made it yeah. work for them. This is just Wakeman's ego <laughs> for about I, a minute well, and actually, a half. You know what happened, and I I didn't know this until before re- going to review this, was that Wakeman was still under contract. He really got screwed, actually. Oh. He was under contract elsewhere with another okay. label, and he he was given the opportunity to go with tour with Bowie because he just played huh. on Life on Mars, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. On that uh, on that uh, song and a few others on that album too, he could have toured with Bowie, but he was also presented on the same day joining Yes. Oh, wow. and he joined Yes, you know, for more creative, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. freedom. But the problem was, he could not get a writing credit. Oh, so mm-hmm. that's why he has no writing credits on this album. You know, there's stuff. Oh, of course, he definitely came up with on this album. Yeah, but he. But because of his contract, mm-hmm. he could not get a writing credit, which is why okay, we are so stuck with this class. That's how we get this. Okay. He just wanted to show off for a while to, 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 to be a little, just because he was annoyed about the writing thing. I get that. And Well, think... there was the other thing was the way they put this album together was by the time he got here, a lot of the group stuff was already worked on. Right, right. And I think it was Bruford that came up with the idea because they had nothing else between the group songs right. was for each of them to do their own individual song, which was all well and good for everybody else. But poor Wakeman could not write a song. Uh-huh. <laughs> he was forbidden to. Oh, so he arranged Brahms. <laughs> and the thing is, in 71, this was probably incredibly cool just for the synthesizers aspect of it and the experimentation yeah. of it. It just ends up dated in 2020 where it, it sounds like Mall Christmas, Mall Christmas music. Right. Um, and ELP like did this, you know, a couple mm-hmm. times already. Yeah. So it's kind of like you, you're, you're late to the game, buddy. <laughs> but, but for a keyboard player, hearing all of these multi-track synthesizers would, was probably pretty cool. It's just... Yeah. We've been there. Yeah. On to track three, we have Heaven. This <laughs> would have been my... If it weren't for the last one, this would have been my weakest. It's <laughs> my just... First is, my guess is EJ will hate this because of its repetition. <laughs> well, there's the repetition. There's... It's just hippie folk. This is... <laughs> when I t- when mentioned the hippie folk contingent of the band last time, this is what I'm talking about. This was... and This is an Anderson song, I'm sure. Um yeah. It's just it's it's the vocals are round, um, meaning right. they they repeat, um, except oh, yeah. and it's just hippie folk except for these occasional loud guitar blasts. <laughs> it's kind of a, a noise experiment, really. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's interesting in that aspect, but I am glad it's only a minute and a half. And then um, it came back at the end of my favorite. <laughs> yes. I mean, well, I was not got, prepared for that. There's definitely a, a joke here, kind of, yeah. you know, that they know they're being annoying. It's kind of like a, a precursor to hip hop sampling, though, isn't it? I mean, they are bit, running, yeah. like, sampling loops here mm. with his voice. And, uh, yeah, of course, the sound of someone slamming the door. Yeah, yeah there's a the door away. and some footsteps at the end, which were a very nice surprise. I meant to look Somebody up the running lyrics. away from it to, like, get up. Oh, it's just like tell the moon dog, tell the march hare. Okay, nothing. We but found heaven. Anderson's he bullshit. Is here. <laughs> it's just like yeah, like Bruford hated Anderson's lyrics, which I always <laughs> found funny yeah. when I listened to his lyrics. I, and just think of how Bruford sitting back there behind the kick going, "What the fuck?" <laughs> I think that's one of the other things, the two things that have kept me from being a big Yes fan, because Yes is a singles band for me, uh, you know. I know the stuff that I've heard on radio. I, I haven't heard many of their full albums. Um, and the th- two things that have always stopped me is Anderson's voice. because, And I say this as a Yes fan, knowing it sounds hypocritical. But <laughs> as a Rush fan, rather, knowing it's hypocritical. Because Getty's voice is absolutely an acquired taste. But Oh, yeah. And with Getty, he's Getty's basically doing a Robert Plant impression. Particularly in the early days. He was trying to be Robert Plant. So he's histrionic and emotional. This is just John Anderson's voice. His speaking voice yeah. is as high as his speak- singing voice. Oh, definitely, yeah. And he's got that hippie thing. So it's a lot of it is just mellow and folky. 
and really fucking high and twee and I just can't and then you get these new age navel gazing lyrics <laughs> if it wasn't for John Anderson I would absolutely love you yes but I just can't deal with him I need to check out ABWI or ABWH um, the one, the album he was in, Anderson Bruford Wakeman and How I need to check that album out but he said that he's Anderson oh Anderson Squire is the one that's not on that. Right. No, I don't need to check that out. Sorry. Um, I need to find the stuff that he's not on that, that, you know, Anderson isn't on. Maybe I'll like that. Uh, I think what drama, I think. Okay. Um, uh, that's 1980. And right. it's, I mean, it's not really memorable. Honestly, it's, it's the Trevor Horn album. No, I think yeah. right it's one of the Trevor Horn albums. Um, but that leads to something much better. It fades in rather nicely to track four, South Side of the Sky. Yeah, I just love the idea of them slamming the door on that mm -hmm. and you hear somebody running away from it. And it's into it. this absolute rocker. Love the groove. Yeah. Love how the bass and guitar blend. Um, this is not only a close second to my favorite on the album, it is a close second to my favorite by the band. <laughs> Um, it, it, I would love to hear like a metal cover of this song someday, yes. you know, like either a speed metal or death metal version. Again, they go almost metal on it. And, and with yes. one exception, it, the best songs are the long ones on this album, which I love. Um, the groove just gets better in the chorus. Love how it leads in, in first two. And then we get this sudden stop down with the piano. Oh yeah, it's out of nowhere. Just like this piano interlude. Like, wait, what? It's just just uh, this full classical piano solo right in the middle of it, and then we get into now, this. Yeah. A, an interesting point, though. This song was written by Anderson and Squire. Okay. But how really takes it places with his guitar work? With his leads, and then Wakeman just owning the middle of it with the piano. And then think back, roundabout was written by Anderson and Howe, but and Squire it's all takes that. <laughs> yeah. so, so isn't that weird? Like they wrote these songs and like some other member of the band goes, I can do something with that. Well, <laughs> it just fucking in, runs you know, with it. In a lot of bands, I know Bandmade works this way particularly, um, the guitarist and the singer, or in the rhythm guitars in Bandmade's case, write the songs. The guitar, the vocalist writes the lyrics, the guitarist writes the music. The rhythm section often writes their own parts. So I think when they came up with Roundabout, they probably was just a melody and some chord changes. They probably didn't intend it to be what it was. Squire yeah. just rocked up with that bass line and just went metal <laughs> with it. All right. And then, yeah, I back mean, to the I would piano guess. interlude, of course. And, and then just Wakeman, and back to South Side of the Sky, Wakeman just takes it over for a while. I love the harmonic development when the na 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 vocals come in. It adds, like, the, the whole part just adds this drama, like, this lost yeah. in the, this chaos. And yeah, they, they build it back up with the na na's. And, it and you think of... it's all wrapped up at five, in, like, 515. It's seven and changed <laughs> in total. Um, but I think that non on our section maybe goes on a little bit too long, but then we get back to the heavy part. Um, just love it. It's like uh, a complete fade out, like yeah, the yeah. song's done. Mm -hmm. And then it just, oh, we're back to part one. Back to yeah, the heavy <laughs> section. That's on a beautiful to, solo at yeah, the end. Yeah. On to track five, another instrumental, 5% for nothing, composed by Bill Bruford. Off, odd to see, unusual to see the the drummer writing stuff. But if a drummer's going to write <laughs> write music anyway, and this, this well, is they, the band for it. Like they they like I said, outside of the group ones like mm -hmm. South Side of the Sky, Roundabout, uh, they all got their individual yeah, yeah. songs. But the, I could have used more of this one. Yeah, it, thirty five seconds just doesn't work. Thirty five seconds me. of this off off kilter, chaotic thing with just bass, drums, and key keyboards and guitar. And yeah, I just love it. It's just enough to keep you interested. You know, it's you gave uh, Wakeman a fucking minute and a half for his classical, yeah, yeah, you know, shopping true. mall music. Give him another minute here. <laughs> it's just a perfect appetizer, though. You know, yeah. it's just that little bit, little little appetizer that it's brilliant and just 
you know, not nowhere near too much. And the one exception to my the long songs are the best on this one, of course, another one of their incredibly well known songs, Long Distance Run Around. Um just Yeah. Like, way shorter than I ever thought it was. I didn't I never realize this was like a three minute song. I always thought that the second part, the second the song after this was part of it. Uh huh. Well, I, they do run Usually together. You hear the two of them together, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, this is like almost like a, the only pop song on the album, actually. And it's kind hmm. of refreshing that it's well, yeah. a pop song. But it's also got a weird structure because it's three verses, an instrumental, and in, back to the instrumental intro, one more verse, and then they're out. Um, yeah. Lo- love the guitar and keys at the beginning. It's kind of got a bit of a steel drum feel. Um, love how the guitar and bass punctuate the verses. Um, great harmonies in the last verse and love how solo at the end. Just, he just gets this short snippet of a solo before the bass harmonics come in. That Yeah, just like the, the end of the last one, he just gets this, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> incredible Little, solo just to end it. Just brief solo that fades real, real nicely into track seven, The Fish. I'm not going to try to pronounce the Latin. <laughs> And this, I mean, it's kind of a weak song here because it's just the same <laughs> beat in him. I you know, it doesn't really go anywhere. Typically complain about repetition, but I like this one. It's just big layer parts over parts over parts that do repeat, but it just in this case it works for me. It gets hypnotic. Like if this is part of long distance runaround. I'm I'm with it, you know, mm. but on its own, it's kind of like really I don't know if it works on its own because it's just you know, him saying that shy delirious. I, I <laughs> is that he's what just, the actual saying lyric that is? Name. That's what yes, the lyrics that, are. That, that, that that's what he's repeating over and over again. I think. Okay. Um, sounds whatever good. that um, that whatever that that fish scientific it's, name. Yeah, is it's a scientific in name. The title of the fish, song. Yeah. That's what he's saying. Yeah. Um, it took me a while to figure that out. <laughs> but I, I love the harmonies, and I just love how hypnotic it gets. Um, it, it does. It's very it, trippy. It does work better with Long Distance Run Around, I agree. Um, you get that, that like, you know, sitar kind of, you know, hippie sound. Mm-hmm. It's as hippie as they get yeah. in this. Oh, no, I, I, I think we have heaven is as hippie as they get. <laughs> On to track eight, Mood for a Day. This is the guitar solo. Um, all, all an acoustic instrumental piece. Um, it's just how showing off. Um, he goes through so many different styles. Yeah, I, I love the <laughs> harmonic choice. Love the harmonic choices throughout the piece. There's this nice sort of Spanish turn about 150. Right. This would have fit. There's bluesiness. There's this, classical. There's yeah. Western. Would have fit nicely on a Tull album. Yeah. Um, it, it, it leans into that category territory very nicely. Um, and on to track nine, for me, the main event. It is my yeah. favorite song on the album and my favorite song by Yes, Heart of the Sunrise. The bass riff in the beginning of this is just fucking epic. I am proud to say I can play it. <laughs> Where um, they always get to like speed metal. <laughs> mm-hmm. I would advise other bass players out there, don't try to finger pick it. You will hurt yourself. <laughs> I need a pick. <laughs> Everyone needs a pick to play this one. Um, but I also love this this eerie synth sound responding to the bass. They do like the call and right. response thing in the very beginning. Um, this this hard ass like metal, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, da, 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 and he's just playing this creepy keyboard, the, like like kind of horror yeah. music, kind of yeah. softly behind it. <laughs> That you know, honestly, thinking, listening to this critically, Wakeman really does make this song. He's, yeah, yeah, and he's not oh, even yeah. like up front there. No. He's just willfully in the background, supporting the whole yeah, thing yeah. and just acting like this whole creepy, weird science fiction kind of thing. This is Squire way up front, owning it, and Wakeman just you know, it's kind of. That meme with the the new version of the Joker, the Joaquin Phoenix version, with the big one and the small one, it's that meme. With, like, <laughs> the big one is Squire, the little one is Wakeman. And they're just 
owning this whole song, just perfecting it. Um, I'm guessing this is probably another Anderson Howe piece that that Squire just took over. <laughs> uh, they they give Bruford a credit on this too. Okay, um, but it starts off with. I mean, this makes me... I've always said Motorhead invented speed metal, but I don't know. This makes me question that, <laughs> considering it's 71. But yeah. then they just get through this thunderous intro and fall into this almost funky groove. And I think this could be some of Anderson's best vocals. I mean, where he's yes, just... absolutely. At the, toward the end. So just, soft. And, and yeah. you're just like, wait, what? <laughs> His dynamics are beautiful, but you know they fall into this almost funky groove, and then more horror music. There's this sinister Mellotron. <laughs> um, also, love the ascending and descending guitar parts before they go right back to that practically metal riff. Yeah, and then it just suddenly gets soft, and and the so. The softness of Anderson's voice is one of the things that irritates me about Yes, but it works on this one. Oh, yeah, but he's so soft on this. And mm-hmm. I mean, uh, the softness never bothered me. It was more of just the, the pitch, you know, mm-hmm. that, oh, yeah. that highness. Uh, John Anderson's took me a long voice. Time to get into. John Anderson's voice is why I will never complain about the people or criticize the people who complain about Getty's voice because I have my own version of that. <laughs> And yeah, the same with Rush. It took me a long time to like, you know, sit down and listen to them because uh, of his voice too. Yeah. Um, love the tone of Howe's guitar in the verse. Love the walking bass that comes in. Um, but there's some great guitar volume spells. And I absolutely those parts where he's being so soft, Wakeman just working with those pianos yeah. uh-huh. and then those real synthy i don't even know what adjectives yeah. you describe them like mechanical keyboards kind of that part, going over them that part that comes in after lo- the line lost in the city yeah that it, it's got to be a, it's a synth and it's just it's in an odd meter but it still grooves i don't know how they right. pulled that off if someone were using that that didn't know what they were doing it would sound fucking terrible it'd yeah. be like what it would sound like a Doctor Who, old Doctor right. Who music yes. kind of thing. But he's using it so melodically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he paints this whole sci-fi kind of picture of just this person wandering about. And I think that's kind of what the song is about. I don't know. I try not to analyze Anderson's lyrics too much, but it kind of does sound like it's just someone wandering around the city. Yeah, I, I think... There, there's kind of a simplicity, you know, a beauty to Anderson's lyrics where he is just, he's talking about something very small mm-hmm. in like, a, but, you know, using it in kind of expanded words and just <laughs> painting a picture for us like that, just a, a snapshot. Right. And lyrically, he doesn't write a whole lot for this. It's just that same. Yeah. There's a verse. lot of repetition. Um, yeah. But and just. It, the way the band explodes after the words sharp and distance yes just these enormous stabs after this really quiet section um and then there's a short break with just guitar and keys that just i love just, the, the combination again works perfectly the tone uh how's tone and some of the keyboard sounds that, that wakeman came up with just work together perfectly um Love how they trade trade off between the opening riff and, and a similar one that complements it really nicely. Like that opening riff comes back, and then there's this other riff they bring in that just kind of sounds similar, but just works really nicely with it. Um, and then suddenly gets loud after this nice quiet bridge. Um, like that last? Are you talking about like, like the last minute of the song, kind of? Before the the dreamer line. Okay. It just um. It just, yeah, it just builds up again, and then they stop down again for that, you know, the line that they, it ends up with the line "Dreamer easy in the chair that really fits you." <laughs> A yeah, line I've had an interesting relationship entirely. with. Um, I don't think I really understand that part exactly. Yeah. That is like a little different. Like that's not what he repeats throughout the song. Yeah, it's it's. 
I'm, I, I again, I'm trying not to analyze the lyrics, but but that 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 it's one tough. is I've had an interesting relationship with. Um, but yeah, I, I just finding I, out that yours is no disgrace is about Vietnam. Okay. Uh, soldiers. Mm-hmm. Like I'm like, wait, what? What? <laughs> I I've recently found out that Leave It is about a band on tour. Oh yeah. It's about touring. Um, that's all. And like missing your your significant other at home. Um. But I love how they take what is essentially the same verse, but vary the arrangement every time because the lyrics are pretty yeah. repetitive. Oh um, yeah. And then the intensity of Anderson's voice at the end, because as soft as he is at the beginning, he is just screaming at the end. And I swear that that last minute, that nine and a half minutes, that is the closing section. I think every prog rock band has taken a shot at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the end of Supper is Ready. It's, I mean, the end of a couple Spock's Beard songs. It's, you know, it's. <laughs> it it's, is that closing section. They, it, they kind of invent prog rock here, I feel. Yeah, there's there's kind of this, this fade upward, this kind of slide upward on the keyboard, and then they just come back with that riff, and it just stops. And then we get a few seconds of We Have Heaven. Some for some <laughs> fucking reason. <laughs> I I really think that was a a real Monty Python influence, actually. Yeah, yeah, probably. Because <laughs> it is it is kind of like a you know, and now. <laughs> it's almost it like is... they're taking the piss out of them themselves, because they're almost admitting that we have heaven is a bad song. Oh yeah, oh they totally are. Well, I think you know. Like I said, they, somebody slamming the door on it and running away. Well, yeah. And somehow the door opened. You hear the door opening again before you hear it again, by the you way. You do? I didn't catch that. It's like a quick like sound effect of the door opening and then it's back. It's oh, like, oh, shit. That is, a, that is so Python. they're back. That is <laughs> yes, absolutely is. Python. I mean, they... this is 71, so mm-hmm. everybody was you know a Python yeah. head at this point right. in England. And because they, they had to know, like, this was their epic magnum opus. Yes. This was their load. And then... It's really funny to have this majestic ending to the song. And then the door opens and... Fuck, they're back. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, now I appreciate that ending. Now that I've looked at it that way. Because, I mean, you're just repeating, like, gather round and, like, this loop sample and mm-hmm. shit. I mean, just... It is pretty funny. <laughs> so I got I mean, we we both know the answer to this question, but we all know what we're gonna say here, but do you recommend it? Yes. There's some the individual songs are <laughs> but I mean the 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 big songs are definitely worth the ride for. The and, little and the you, little ones are short anyway. Absolutely recommend. Just skip track two. Maybe listen to track three just so you're prepared for the end of of Sunrise. (laughs) I think when I was listening to this song on an older phone, I did not have a whole lot of hard drive space. So I don't think Constant Proms made it onto it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if in any other year when we're not in the middle in the middle of a pandemic, if you're putting a, you're having a Christmas party and you want move, move music that kind of sounds appropriate but gets people out the door, just put Cons and Brahm on a loop. Oh, I was going to say you could do uh, We Have Heaven. No, I mean, it kind of sounds like bad Christmas music. Just put that on a loop. People will leave. I mean, if you want to do We Have Heaven as well, yeah. That, that's how you chase me. That's yeah. the Star Wars holiday special. Of, uh... <laughs> wow. Um, you heard the story, Carrie Fisher. Yeah. Like... yeah. When she had a party and wanted people to leave, she'd put on the Star Wars holiday right, yeah, special. Yeah, yeah. 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 Anyway, that's it for Fragile. Until next time, we'll be reviewing Excitable Boy by Warren Zevon. Nice. Very different musically, but just as brilliant. Until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you are. There you are.